Hey everybody, welcome to The Lawyer's Daughter. We are gonna talk about something incredibly serious today, and I'm gonna try my best. I've already done this once and I had to throw the recording out because I actually lost it in the middle, um, not crying or anything, swearing. I was using a lot of profanity. So I wanna give a warning here. This is an incredibly serious subject to me. I've been waiting to do this because it's um, really important to me. And it has everything to do with what we've been hearing in the victim statements. And it has to do with two statements today. So before we get started, though, I want to be clear, this video is not for children. This video, don't put this on in the background when you're walking around, because I'm going to be graphic. And in fact, what I'm going to read to you is going to be graphic. So I want you to not have the kids around. I don't want anybody to overhear this that shouldn't overhear this. And then the second warning I'm going to give you is anybody that's been sexually assaulted, honestly, this could be incredibly triggering. Now, if you've had the, there's not, what's the right word, temerity? resilience, ability to watch these victim statements. If you've already, if you've been a sexual assault victim and you've been able to get through this, if you're like me and just crying your way through them, um, you might be able to handle this, but I still want to warn you because this is going to make you mad. It's going to make you very angry. And the most interesting thing, so, so there's your warning. I, you know, turn this off if you've got kids in the car. Please don't listen to this. This is nothing for children. The, the most important takeaway right now when I listen to these uh, victim impact statements is that how things work if you're it, it is the, the way the world works right now is that if you are raped the person who lives with the shame is the rape victim it's not the rapist the rapist can be characterized in a number of ways if you rip a woman with sticks and stones and things down at Stanford you're a promising young man who has a future ahead of him I don't know what the hell the woman had ahead of her but She's ruined now, just like Gay's piece of paper, all crumpled up and has to try to stretch that paper back out and remove the wrinkles. Um, you heard a lot about Gay's other quotes. She, she was remarkable today in bringing both science, the psychology and the physical impact of PTSD and the quotes from our leaders about rape being, you know, eh, it's not that important, it's not that bad. Women can take a beating and keep on ticking. I don't know what that is. But as long as we live in a world where men are characterizing rape and interpreting rape, unless they've been raped, and we know that happens, but as long as we are allowing men to carry this narration and bring their interpretation to the situation, we're not going to ever get past this BS. And the fact that my friends, because who thought I was going to wake up and have all my good friends up here be rape victims, the fact that my friends are able to talk about this and do not want to be known as Jane Doe, that they want to own their names and their crimes is the first step to all of us, all of us healing. But I'm going to caveat that because they had something, and I've been told this several times and I get it, I totally get it. These victims had something that many victims don't, and that's a stranger rape. More often than not, it's not a stranger that's raping. It's some miserable bastard that's in your life. It's someone you know and trust, someone who understands your vulnerability, someone who understands that what they're going to do to you is going to change you, change you from the inside out. So when we talk about rape and we talk about the interpretation and we talk about the, the gift these people had, can you believe I'm saying the sentence of having a stranger rape? We need to understand we're talking about a, a, a field of landmines. And, in, and we need to be able to have everybody who's been raped be able to say what's true, not suspect them, not shame them. The people that need the shame are the rapists. And I am singing to the choir right now because I know anybody who's watching this right now already understands that. That's, you know, people say I have amazing followers. I do because y'all y'all understand that. But well, let's carry this forward, okay? Let's take this story forward because I'm gonna show you a couple examples. And this is based, so I've been, I've been wanting to do this. I've been working really closely with Michelle who testified today. She has been, she's a wreck. She, there's two people in this journey who I see as, and, and that I know, let, let's just say that I know, because I, I don't know all the survivors. Some of them, like Mary, we just are meeting some of these, Joanne, we're meeting some of these folks right now. But I know that there are, um, two people in this journey who have had severe pain and they're still in that pain today. Two of them are what I'm going to talk about today, Victor and Michelle. So Michelle's had kind of uh, 
I wanted her to do it much stronger, but she did so great. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to ever influence when people ask me for help. My whole thing is I don't want to influence your, your story, your mission, your narrative, even your vocabulary, because everybody has their own. So I typically only coach on what points did you want to get across? Am I hearing it? And then slow down when you speak and, and just be, be real, be authentic. That's it. Slow down, be authentic. Um, we are listening. I think sometimes people think that, especially women, we think nobody's listening, so we have to hurry. But in this case, people are listening, which is powerful. Okay, so what Michelle said today, her throwaway line was, after I was raped, I was then re-victimized. I was libeled. So one of the things that's happened is we've had police people write books. And, uh, and let me tell you just really quickly, by the way, because it's so related. Um, I found myself, I've been wanting to talk to Paul Holes because I believe he lied to, excuse me, I believe he lied to me. And it, as it happened today, we had a moment alone, like just the two of us, complete, excuse me, I had to wolf down really bad lunch. Um, completely palpable silence, just he and I in the ante room outside the courtroom. Um, Maylin wasn't even there. I, saw, I put a picture of her up on Twitter, but she wasn't even there at that moment. It was just us. In fact, Anne, Anne Tran, who, these are both the victim services people, came back and had, told us to leave because I was yelling so loud. I don't know if they could hear me in the courtroom, but I was pissed. The reason I was pissed in the conversation I had with Paul, and I'll just give you this part right now because it's super interesting to me, is I said, Paul, you know, when you, you lied to me, you told me you would work with HBO to get that out. He said that, um, of course I have the hiccups. He said that um, he did talk to them, but they said it was already in the can and it was done. And I said, well, that's actually not what they said. They emailed to me. They said that you felt confident in it, your statement that Charlene was raped in the bed next to my father, which I think is just so humiliating to say, share that story. Number one, Ventura won't confirm or deny. I mean, they did deny it. Ventura won't confirm it. But when I spoke to Paul, I said, here's the thing, Paul, when you speculate, because of now you having power, you have great responsibility. It's, it's just when you have great power, you have responsibility. And when you say something now, that speculation, because of your perceived authority and perceived knowledge on topics, people will believe you. So you can't just say something speculatively now. I said, even on my, my little podcast, I take, I do, a, I take a lot of, um, make a lot of effort and I work really hard to bring you stuff that's factual. I go check sources, I talk to somebody else, I do everything possible to not share things that I don't know are true unless I tell you this is gossip. And even with that, when I share gossip, I share the stuff that's gonna be generally harmless. So, so when I said that to Paul, when you speak, people listen and they believe you as an authority, he said, I never thought about that. Now that makes sense to me. I know because I come out of corporate marketing. All we do is pay, pay attention to what we say. It has to be on message. If you say something, even the SEC can come after you, right? You have to be, you know, are you a fiduciary? Who are you working for? What do you have to say? Um, and I apologize. I'm on my old computer. It's pretty crappy, but this is my laptop. Uh, so I think that he came out of police work. He, he wasn't, he didn't come out of the same school of communications that I did. And I don't think he's really thought about it, but I, that's what I said. I said, look, I I'm holding you accountable and you can't just throw away things and say sentences that may or may not be true. You have to actually take responsibility for being much more true about it. So it was a good talk. Um, I thanked him for having the courage to let me yell at him because I yelled at him, accused him of lying to me. And I'm still not clear what the truth is, but it kind of doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is that we were able to have that conversation. And if anything, if I gave him the gift of awareness, that's huge. Um, so that's, I mean, what more could I ask for, honestly, right? That's, that's all we want to do is be able to help each other be better. That's really the bottom line. That's what this is all about. That's why I do this podcast, just to help all of us be better. Okay, so what I want to talk about today has everything to do with interpretation. The two things, actually two things, shame and interpretation. Because the shame... The victims bear this shame, and I'm so proud of I'm so proud of my friends for not wanting to be Jane Doe's and Victor. He didn't want to be a John Doe. They want to own their crimes. This is one of the first steps in starting to change this, right? That the stigma shouldn't be attached to the rape victim. The stigma belongs to the rapist, and it's only because men own the narrative right now that that's true. 
as we all, as the victims start to take back the narrative, and sadly, as we have more cases, that's what's happening. But as the victims start to own the narrative, they can say, I'm not a Jane Doe. That's just a misogynistic approach to this, if you think about it. Now, I'm not talking about minors. I absolutely would not release minors' names. But at a point in being adult, I don't know. I've never, I haven't asked them. I don't know how they would have felt if their names came out right away. Some of my friends were younger. Margaret, Chris, they were young, so they would have been minors. But Gay, I'll ask Gay about that. What if they had actually put her name in the paper when it had happened? The problem is now we're talking about the 70s. It's very different than today, all of those things. But, but we lived and we still do live in a world where women, there are rapeable women based on perceptions out there. Only good girls shouldn't get raped. And did I, did I discuss the dis difference between being raped by a stranger versus someone you know? Because being raped by a stranger is then a good rape. Being raped by someone you know, that's a bad rape. You can't really talk about that one. That one, that one's of course more cruel, right? Because that's when they take something from you. They know you and they take something from you. I'd like to think D'Angelo really didn't know the people that he attacked with a few exceptions. I understand a few people were absolutely targeted, but I'd like to think generally he wasn't thinking, oh, I need to go destroy Gay and Bob Hardwick today. I don't think that's really how he rolled in general. But the people that are raped by people that know them, they know who they're destroying. They know it is not a sexual act. It's an act of violence and it's an act of control and it's an act of power. And so I, I'm preaching to the choir. I have, like I said, the most sophisticated uh, people who watch my stuff. So I'm kind of, I'm preaching to the choir. You guys know all this, but I just wanna articulate it again because this is the message we all need to carry forward that it's okay not to be a Jane Doe. There is not shame in being raped. There is no such thing as a rapeable woman. And there is absolutely nothing a woman does that leads to her own rape. Sorry, there's just not. There's not, I don't care if you walk naked down the street. No, because you know what? You don't have a right to touch my body. That's just the bottom line. I don't care what's wrong with your brain. You don't get a right to touch my body. That's mine. Okay, so. That's this is all stuff you know, but let's then talk about what it feels like when you talk to the police about your crime. You're laid bare. Victor spoke a little bit of it yesterday. He heard detectives laughing in his home. That would have really upset me too, because there's a time and a place for everything. That is not the time nor the place. In fact, we all know what is it? it's like a common meme now of seeing cops standing around a crime scene outside laughing. Like, why are they all just standing there? Do they not have something to do? Why is it we have to see them laughing? Um, I get it, it's gallows humor. Ha, I laugh too at dark stuff, but the thing is the perception's off, right? So, so when the police officers not just investigate your crime, but then they take it upon themselves to write a book, you would think, you might think that writing that book is sacred. And the nature in which you speak of these victims is sacred, that you would hold these victims so gently in your hands as you take responsibility for telling their story and, and, and protect them as you tell the story in a way that they're held sacred, not in what happened to Michelle and Victor, and they're just a couple. So the person I'm talking about, um, the person I'm oh, sorry, one more thought. Person I'm talking about, I've actually had an experience with too, and my experience has been negative. And I'm going to do this carefully because the last thing I want to do is fire up the Ann Penn factor. But anybody, if you don't know about Ann Penn, you're not missing anything. Um, she's a person. She's a fine person. I don't know her at all. I could not speak to her character other than the things that uh, happened between us, which hasn't been great. Um, there's a blog about her on my blog on lawyersdaughter.com. You can go look up Ann Penn. It's an absolute factual description of what's going on. She was my grandfather's step-granddaughter. So that made her my peer, except that I never knew her and I didn't know about her. And we never spent time with her because her grandmother, the woman my, dad, my grandpa married, prevented us from seeing my grandpa. That's what my mom would do, sneak attacks to Curtis Park so we could see my grandpa without telling anybody because Max was so effective at keeping us away from him. And essentially, if you were like, what did she do? She stand at the go, go, gun, stand with a gun at the door. No, what she would do is that if, if we got anywhere near her, 
she would just bombard us with her. She would take over, you all know this kind of person who took up all the space, like almost takes up all the oxygen and all they wanna do is talk about themselves. That was Max. I mean, the name is perfect. She was a, she was a terrible, terrible person. And so we weren't around. And so Anne Penn, which is a um, pen name. Uh, sorry, I just roll my eyes because I like Anne Penn, pen name. But she has a real name. I don't know why she keeps her real name private. I at least will call her Lori. Um, she wrote a book about uh, about my grandpa, I guess. I, every time I look at the book, I'm not even sure what it's about. It's just kind of this rambling, dithering thing. But um, I, I, I have only looked at it in terms of what is this thing, but it's, it's, it's not very well written and it's, it's not very relevant because it's not about anything except my grandpa crying. And she's done a few interviews, but I know that she basically upset all the folks that she interviewed because she did it under a pretense. Um, but moreover, she didn't know my dad and Charlene. So that's, that's probably the most important part of it. I had somebody say, well, I've read that book. And I go, well, good for you. You met my grandpa. And you met my grandpa through her eyes, not through our eyes, not through his family's eyes. But okay, that's still fine. She loved him. I think that's good. But let me just get back to the point. And Penn, Lori, worked with Larry Crompton. And that's the star of our show today. Good old Larry Crompton. He is the author of sudden terror. So let me tell you about my run-in because this is when I learned what kind of a man this is that I was dealing with. Um, one of the things that Larry and Anne had teamed up to do was to take the Cat Winners and Keith Comos book off of Amazon. Yep, they did. They knocked it right off the Amazon because Larry, and I don't even know if it was Larry, could have just been Lori doing all of this at Larry's request. I really don't understand the relationship. I just know it's tight and they they kind of tend to juice each other. But um, Larry.Crompton at gmail.com sent a message and said this was this that this is copyrighted and that Cat and Keith had stolen this image. Now I'm gonna I, I think that's hilarious because frankly it's a man in a mask. And I don't know how it could be copyrighted, but okay. But moreover, to have the chutzpah, as we say, to get somebody else's book taken off of Amazon for copyright infringement over something so incredibly trivial, especially when I'm going to tell you what kind of a person Larry is, it's ghastly to me. I, I absolutely don't, like I have never, ever, ever commented on Anne's book other than what I've just done, which is to say it's poorly written, but I have not gone on Amazon and left a review. That is just not how I roll. I am not about to go prevent somebody else from doing their thing as long as it doesn't hurt me. The only times I've really lost my patience with her is when she's crossed over the line and hurt someone like Keith and Kat and having their book removed from Amazon. Their book is one of the best books out there. It's the Beanie Baby Guide to These Crimes. And they also have one for the Visalia Ransacker. It's the, it's the one that lists all the cases. And it's not, it's descriptive, not narrative. So you get just what happened you don't get interpretation. That's something that they held in high regard as they went through and described the, the crimes. So I had to call Larry because I couldn't believe that they had done this and it needed to be rescinded so that that book could get back up. Because that book straight up was a really good, that was a work of love and they had done an amazing job and I wanted to make sure it could get listed again. So finally, after having no success with Anne who just spun and spun and spun. I mean, like just, it just wasn't conversations that were productive. Um, I called Larry. And when I called Larry, I just so immediately found out what a misogynist he was because here's how he responded. And I told him like, you gotta stop. You're getting her wound up. She's doing stuff on your behalf using your name. Uh, I don't even know if you know what she's doing in your name. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. That's between you two. I said, but it has to stop. And what he said to me was, you girls just need to sit down and talk. This is just a family dispute. And I said, Larry, not related to her. I don't know her. I couldn't identify her on the street. Moreover, I don't appreciate it you telling me what I need to do when you're the one that's done the thing that's wrong. You need to take care of this. You are hurting someone. You are costing someone else money, financial impact by your behavior that is, that is, absolutely narcissistic and ridiculous. 
he would have none of it. He didn't, he will, he will not bend. And that's exactly, you know, I, I, I don't know that I would have understood what Michelle was telling me, which was very similar until I went through it myself. So I realized he thinks he's great and he thinks he's good and he doesn't care about anybody else. And now I'll share that with you. So, so two people that I have already steady contact with, some of the people yesterday I had it, I haven't met and I don't, I didn't know their story until I heard them with you, but two people who I have met that I care about very, very much um, are Victor and, and particularly Michelle. Victor and I'm not, I would, Victor and I are not close, but I care about him, but we're not close. But Michelle and I are. And what I noticed with both of them is they have an extreme amount of what I would call very palpable pain. Um, I actually heard from a couple other survivors yesterday with that kind of pain too, as, their, as other members of their family spoke on their behalf. But because I know these two, I've, I've, I have felt the pain, like when I talk to them. And the two of them have something in common. And Michelle spoke to it today on her statement, which after Gay's amazing statement, uh, just when Gay's amazing statement in terms of her using these facts, bringing in quotes and the marginalization of rape victims and the science of PTSD, that that's really valuable because all we're going to have is this narrative when we're all done of, of we don't have a real trial record of any sort. So that's a good way to do it, to bring that into the record. And then, of course, you saw um, Victor's statement yesterday. And if you haven't, please go watch it. But there's just this palpable pain. And for Michelle, she had one line in her statement today. And it was that even after she was raped, the thing that hurt her worse, the thing that was did so much damage, was being libeled in this book by good old investigator detective Crompton now when I'm gonna read this to you I'm gonna take you through it because it's 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 gonna it's gonna upset you but I'm gonna start with Victor's first because he covers all the cases in here but the thing is he says up front apparently that it's a mix of truth and fiction well the parts I'm gonna to read to you are represented as truth and what I want you to pay attention to is the re-victimization of the victims. So the person that you think should, if you're going to write a book and everybody talks about it, and this is why I love Todd Lindsay and Unmasking a Killer because he was so committed to this in doing the in doing his show. But again, I'm going to hold up my hands and say you need to hold the victims in a special, special way because you're being given the opportunity to take care of them in your writing, not re-victimize them. All right, so here we go. Let me just shut up and, and get on with it, Jen. You guys are all saying, look, I look like ratchet. Okay, here we go. Let's do this. Let me just get this for you because you're going to need to, I'm going to be reading a little bit, but I also want you to be able to see it. So hopefully you're able to see this. So the book is called Set in Terror. This is not an endorsement of the book. I believe you can read most of the PDF online on Google if you put in a uh, sudden terror PDF, because so I don't want you to give him any money. That's me. I really don't want you to give him one ounce of money. Uh, so please don't buy the book. Please go read it online somewhere. Let me t share with you the, how he sets up, this is in chapter, um, in chapter 33. So that's deep in this book. This book is big. I mean, it is, it's a big old thick thing. Stunning to me. He has this one thing I have in the yellow box here. Rape is a terrifying ordeal and for most victims, and I'm gonna leave you with that just right there. And for most victims, a traumatic experience. So this, this to me right here, this, this sets up what I'm gonna go through with you because this, just this belief that is a traumatic experience that leaves most victims terrified for the rest of their lives the fact that he doesn't think it's all, and he's going to tell me, I'm sure he'd argue with me, I'm a police officer and it doesn't traumatize everybody. I'm going to say that's just not true. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with the affirmative, that anytime somebody decides to, to do things with your body without your consent, that's going to lead to trauma. And I think Gay started to take us down that road today. That's the gift that keeps on giving. The body memories, the fears, the hypervigilance, the paranoia, the anticipation, the, the, the paranoia, I don't say the paranoia again because that's even hit me. Like you just, your vigilance and your fear of the unknown makes you freaking crazy. 
and you do become paranoid. And that's why we drink or use drugs or whatever, because at some point you just want to relax. Like, can I just calm down? So this, I found this paragraph today, just, I just didn't realize it was in there, but this idea of rape is a terrifying ordeal and for most victims, a traumatic experience. So is that if we, if we embrace this as his truth, because he wrote this as truth, unless this is the fiction, maybe that's it. But if we embrace this as truth that he at least intellectually understands the concept of it being traumatic, then you'd think that this would impact how he spoke of these cases. But let me just take you gently through what's here. And you'll start to understand the anger. And, and I believe Michelle probably could have talked for three hours, like Victor, about what this did to her. But she did it in a sentence and a half. And I know she was terrified to speak at all because she has not been particularly public. Um, and this is why. Okay, so when he, so when Larry goes in, he talks about all the cases um, with different, different voices in a weird way. There's definitely a thing in looking at this, like rhetorically, there's definitely a thing in Larry's head that says some people were worthy and some people deserved it. I, 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 that's a broad generalization. I really don't want to put those words in his mouth because I don't think he'd ever say anybody deserved to be raped. And so let's let's just put that up there as the as the polar distinction of having two polar opposites. But I don't want to put those words in his mouth at all because I don't think that's true. But there but there is there is some kind of a scale. There is some evaluative process. And again, this is interpretation that goes on. And here you go. You've already read this because I just babbled through it. But this is about Victor. He, he just jumps in and said, let's talk to Vickers for a minute. And that's not Victor. That's a, um, that's a stupid name he uses for somebody else. I don't know how he did this. It'd be so confusing. Anyway, let's talk to Vickers for a minute and we'll talk to the male. That's Victor. Got names, Burns, Burns interjected. Female is Margarita Lopez. Male is Harvey Westcott. One other thing that doesn't fit. One other thing that doesn't fit. He's a biker type a little lower on the food chain than EAR has been used to. Okay, so right there in print for all eternity, Victor has been marginalized. He is somehow less than. And I think you saw that anger yesterday. He has been treated less as less than by several people. And I know that's been his journey and that's BS. It's just BS. It doesn't have, it does, I don't care if you're, you don't conform to what they want you to be, to be a good girl or to be a good boy. The difference between Victor and Bob, both powerful men, but completely different comportment. That should not determine how you're treated. And in fact, Bob's good comportment didn't really affect how he was treated because San Joaquin let those guys, those poor hard books just hang in the breeze. But, but this is important because this is an investigator. This is the people that are here to do the job and he's here to represent Victor's case if he's going to choose to write about it. But instead what he does is say, it doesn't fit. One other thing that doesn't fit, he's a biker type, a little lower on the food chain than EAR has been used to. Well, that, if anything, by the way, supports Victor's thing that this was personal. There you go. If that's, if that theory is true, and I'll question the theory because I just don't think D'Angelo I think he was going for a housing type, not necessarily a person type, but whatever, I don't know, I'm not in his head, who knows? The point is, when somebody writes a book, to point out that he is lower on the food chain is absolutely unacceptable, but let me just raise the bar for you for a minute. And I, I apologize for this in advance because the, the woman hasn't been named till Victor named her yesterday, so don't be all sleuthy and everything, just accept that he probably shouldn't have mentioned her name yesterday, and I feel a little bad showing you this, except I need you to understand the pain these people are going through and why. Here we go. Turn the page. Lopez had undergone an abortion just two days prior to the attack. There's all you need to know. That is not relevant. It does not affect anything in this story. It was absolutely positively personal information that should not have been considered up for, for public consumption. 
This book was published in 2010. So if you're wondering time and space, well, Jen, it was like the 2000s. It was the 2000s, but her family might not have known. Hispanic last name, good chance Catholic, right? All those are all biases, but I'm gonna just put it out there because what I have seen is almost everyone that's been involved in this has had a really good spiritual sense, whatever that means. But this is not something she probably wanted her family to know. Why would Larry share something? This has been so hard for them for all these years since he published that book in 2010. I'm looking at the book over on my shelf. So this is just an example again of the police. This is someone who had access and that's what's really important. He had access. This is such a good example of the police, in this case, Larry Crompton, doing something so dishonorable that will live on and he's making money off of it. And that'll be my last entree which is, this wasn't even, it's not like he's writing a book for a rape crisis center so they can make the profit. No, this is for Larry. This is Larry's money. He has a pension, he's good. But he needed to make, he needed to look important here. Very important. So he wrote this book, it's about his ego. Clearly not about the two victims in this case. Not about this ranch of the rape at all. Mm -mm. It was about him and his bias and his interpretation. Okay, now I'm gonna take you to Michelle's story. And this one is gonna be a lot harder. I mean, that if that didn't already make you mad, because it, it should make you mad, um, this is gonna be more. This is gonna be intense. And I, I, I know you're reading ahead, that's okay, I can deal with that. I do that all the time. But what I want you to hear, this story, the way this story's gonna go is I'm just reading to you, it's about, let me just turn to the page. Um, so and I didn't buy this book. I stole it from Chris last night. I've been trying to get my hands on this. I've been doing so much research on this issue and I'll tell you about that in just a second. But yeah, okay, so here's the book. It's just this spread, 354, 355. And honestly, I'm just reading from here and then here. So when you'll see, I'm gonna go through a couple of slides, but it's just this little bit at the bottom that kind of gives you the starting point. And then all of this down the side, okay. So, and I just wanted to put it here so you'd have the verbatim, so it'd be in the recordings so everybody could know exactly what I'm talking about. On January 10th, Ford, his partner, and I met with Sonny Walther, the San Ramon victim of October 28th. Now, I'm going to stop right there because I'm going to do a little tiny bit of what I do with rhetoric. I want you to note that name that he uses as her pseudonym. He doesn't call her by her real name, although it's not particularly hard to figure out if you happen to know who was raped on October 28th. But... The, the pseudonym that he has chosen, Sonny Walther, is an interesting one to me. And that's because what he's chosen there is an adjective. And it's not just an adjective, like, hmm, oh, it could be a daisy, although it kind of suffers from the same problem. Daisy would be on a noun, but uh, let's see, Sonny, yeah, daisy is a noun. I do know nouns in part. But the idea, like, I think you'll get my point. To name this person, Sonny, begins to cast her in this role, right? When you think of someone as Sunny, you do start to have a perception of what they are. That's just how we work. A name connotes certain things. Everybody named Karen right now wants to shoot themselves. So I think it's interesting that he chose the name Sunny instead of like a name like Kathy or Ann or Sarah or something else pretty nondescript. And he went out of this way to choose a name, Sunny Walder the San Ramon victim of October 28th. So just sit with that, because that starts to, to me, it starts to show the uh, interpretation, as we say. During her hypnosis, she said that she had observed a beige Toyota drive by her residence on the day of the rape. On November 16th, she had again seen the vehicle on San Ramon Boulevard and had copied down the license number. Now that, to me, just now that next passage, that's just uh, two sentences. But to me, that tells me a lot about our, our victim that she was able to, A, remember a car in her neighborhood, which I think is amazing, because I don't think I could do that. And number two, she remembered it so well that she saw it in town later, but had the courage, and I'm gonna stress this, the courage to follow that car and get the license number. Think about that. You think this might be a suspect, and you start chasing that car. Now, if you knew Michelle, that's absolutely who she is. She is a no shits given kind of person. She does not put up with, idiots very well. So I was like, I read that and I go, 
I don't know why this makes you mad. This is like amazing. Well, it's because what happens next. But to me, this is amazing that she was had the presence of mind to do that because she didn't know if that was a suspect or not, but she was on it. She was on it. <clears throat> Ford, his partner, had previously eliminated the driver of the vehicle as an EAR suspect after contacting him and learning he had been looking for houses in hopes of purchasing one. Crap. All right. Wrong guy. The problem was, and that's, that's right here. Here we go. He's now setting this up as the problem, and this is where it becomes blamey. You're going to blame the victim, right? The problem was that while under hypnosis, Alder stated that the image she related to investigators was of the driver of the beige Toyota. Now she was sure that the image she saw in her bedroom mirror, that this was the image she saw in her bedroom mirror. So she's like, it feels like the same guy. It seems like the same guy to me. This raised doubt as to whether the composite done by investigators would be of any use. Now that's definitely a police point of view. Would it be of any use? I would think in the nature of an investigation, you know you're gonna get stuff that's useful and stuff that's not useful, but that's kind of what investigating is, right? Going to determine what's useful and what's not useful. Here's what's important about this is that, first of all, she says it wasn't her bedroom mirror because that's not how her, they had, they were moving out of their house. And so it was the last night before the next day was like finish all the moving. So there was not a lot of stuff in the house, but also she, she described it to me is that she was laying on her tummy, hands tied, you know, blindfolded, but she was able, and I, and if you're watching on video right now, if you're listening, you'll know what I'm talking about. But if you're watching on video right now, you kind of tuck your head down to your shoulder as I'm tucking my head down now. And you can kind of see underneath this, even if you were blindfolded, you might be able to use that little pocket in your cheek by your nose to peek. What she remembers seeing is a facelit in the bathroom mirror. And she goes, I don't know where the sunlight came from. And I checked, or the light came from. And I checked and there was no full moon that night. And I said, there's a good chance because of his flashlight that he had just, he was just fixing his mask or something. That flashlight hit the mirror and lit his face in that second. And that's probably why you saw him because the light hit the, you know, that light would catch your eye, especially as you're laying there trying to figure out what the hell is going on. And you're, miserable and you're panicked that that all makes sense to me so that's a that's a bone of contention for her, but i think to me this sets the stage of blaming the the witness and and i just start to get an indication and the only reason this is important where i'm going to take you next during the interview which i believe is the hypno the hypnosis interview of sunny walder i got the feeling that the rape incident wasn't really that frightening to her it was almost like this was the ultimate turn on a fantasy that had been fulfilled. As we left, I disclosed my feelings to my partner Ford. It seemed like her eyes actually glazed over when she was describing the attack, I stated. I picked up on that also, Ford said. I thought it was just me, but I noticed her eyes when she was talking about being tied up and naked with the EAR standing over her. Okay, now Steph, you can start screaming at me. Go ahead, start screaming where you're sitting because I don't know that I've ever seen anything other than the courtroom. It's down in Palo Alto when that Brock kid was kicked by that ridiculous judge who said this kid has a bright future ahead of him as a rapist. He didn't say that part. I said that part. I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine reading about my rape and hearing from a police officer that they were watching me while under hypnosis, which is already kind of gross. That feels like a, a violation right there. I don't think they should have been allowed to watch, but they're watching her during hypnosis because they could have heard the audio tape. That should have been enough. And they've decided, Larry's decided to tell it the way the story goes in his head. In his head, it was the ultimate turn on. In Larry's head, it was a fantasy that, she, that had been fulfilled. I don't know how in the world he would ever know what Michelle's fantasies are or what turned her on but he knew this was ultimate. It had been fulfilled. He knew, and he wrote it. He wrote it down here for all fucking eternity. This is what she's had to live with. But wait, there's more. Well, she is definitely one of the prettiest he has hit, said Crompton, but I get a real strong feeling that this marriage is just about over. I'm sorry, I just can't believe that's in writing. Here comes Ford. The part that threw me is when she said that when the EAR told her to orally copulate him, she told him she needed a drink of water first. A woman being raped, Ford said. Would she really be worried that her mouth is dry? It was almost as 
it was almost like she was reliving it when she described EAR throwing water on her face and breast, but not reliving the terror like all the others described, Crompton said. It was more like reliving an orgasm. I shook my head. Okay, this is the last first recording I did of this. I was so profane because first of all, this is two men now, but it's Larry writing it. So I don't know about Ford, but this is two men now discussing how a victim feels, what they were thinking, what they're imagining, imagining, and how they experienced this. So first of all, but, but first of all, she had to pass the pretty test because you know, that's what the cops care about in rape is if you were pretty enough and if you were good looking, then of course, I mean, I could see why he had to have you because you know, women were just chattel. So first we have the shitty prettiest comment, which he put in print because he didn't have shame because he thought this was okay. Then though, then we're going to talk about these two men's ability to understand how to give blowjobs. So I didn't know Larry was experienced at this. I didn't know Ford either, but apparently for them to give a blowjob, they can't have a dry mouth. And that's top of mind because that's the first reason you would need a glass of water is because of that in you know, a dry mouth. Not because we women, which they are not, have been taught to do anything possible on the planet to slow down the person trying to harm you. We have been taught to, I, I, God knows I've taught Katie this, you pee your pants, you shit yourself, you vomit, you do anything you can that they didn't expect that will throw them off their pattern. And we know D'Angelo had a pattern. And so the fact that, I don't know why Michelle asked for the glass of water. For the love of God, she doesn't either. But I suspect it's five in the morning. She's caught up out of a deep sleep. She's, they, they've spent the whole day before moving. My God, she would be just wiped out. But the idea of asking for a drink of water is effing brilliant because now you've got him catering to you. You just changed it around. You just got some control back. That's what I would like to have seen written here, that that was effing brilliant. That's what all victims should do. Like I said, pee, poo, vomit, anything. Sit down. I mean, I can use my body weight to sit down and just be hard to move. There are things you can do. I see this as one of those affirmative things, but apparently not because Apparently, all women care about is making sure they don't have a dry mouth before a blowjob, because that's something we're all going to talk about. But then they go on to say that the throwing of the water was some kind of what a feeling Jennifer Beale moment where she dumps the bucket on herself during that dance routine and then get up and, flat and throw your hair back and forth, cascading the water off of you. He threw water on her face and breasts because he thought she was garbage, not because she was reliving an orgasm. Again, unless Larry slept with Michelle and he hasn't, I don't know that he knows what that looks like. Chances are maybe he doesn't know what an orgasm looks like altogether. I, that's just speculation, but maybe that's the problem. Maybe he couldn't see one if he knew one. Lack of experience, what do you gotta say? Anyway, what did happen, I'll just clarify this little part of the story for those of you that are playing the home edition, is that that man, D'Angelo, he's gonna use profanity again, but I'm gonna try to hold back. Not only did he make her orally copulate him, but he came back to ejaculate into her mouth specifically as if she was some sort of animal receptacle. It just, it just only gets worse from there, right? It just only gets worse from there. So I'm just gonna say that I find this paragraph despicable, but wait, there's more. This is the last part, but it just, it's gonna end on, you're not gonna believe. Here he goes, this is Larry talking. I didn't realize how accurate we were in our assessment. Now just sit with that for just one second. Imagine the egocentric, fuckery of thinking that you were right about all the things you just wrote, which are absolutely, absolutely insane because you didn't talk to her. You just interpreted all of it and you interpreted it in the dis most disgusting way possible for whatever bias you had against her for whatever reason. 
but now you're going to conclude that you were right. I didn't realize how accurate we were in our assessment until two years later when I was working as a patrol agent in Central County. I got a call from dispatch to meet state and federal narcotics officers. They were going to search, search, serve a search warrant on the methamphetamine lab um, in the unincorporated area of Concord and requested that I accompany them. They showed me two photographs, one of the cooker, the person running the lab, and one of his girlfriend. I recognized the girlfriend as EIR victim, Sonny Walder. This is important before I go on that you know that it was not Sonny Walder, but I'm pretty sure you already figured that out. During the search of the residence, although no one was home, I located several photographs of Walder and her biker boyfriend. Many of these explicit photographs of Sonny Walder, explicit photographs, of Sunny Walder orally copulating, oh, we're back to his sweet spot, aren't we? Orally copulating her doper boyfriend while looking directly into the camera lens. Maybe the rape wasn't her ultimate fantasy. Maybe this was. I felt sorry for her husband and her young son. Band of brothers, that's right. So here's the deal. Michelle positively affirmatively denies that this is true. She has denied it since this book has been published. She has tried to sue this man. She could not get anyone to take the lawsuit because he was a law enforcement officer associated with, the, associated with this case and apparently people don't want to touch the case. Right now, I appeal to anyone who knows a lawyer that would take Michelle's case to please come forward. She needs help. Moreover, I've spent the last two weeks because Michelle, like this, I can't even explain to you in words how this upsets her. Like, it, it's like, it's like psycho stuff, right? You, you guys know this because you've had things like this that have upset you, that she becomes almost like so angry that she almost can't figure it out. I was trying to think of the right words for that. Um, but what I want to tell you is I've spent the last two weeks trying to, trying to prove what's affirmative in here, which is there was a search warrant somewhere in that county in 1980, 81, somewhere in that time frame, 80 or 81, because the rape was in 78, so it could be 81, maybe the beginning of 82. I've tried to find the search warrant. Well, it turns out search warrants aren't Freedom of Information Act. Also, we're in a terrible time for records. I've talked to a number of people. I went at this a couple of different ways, but I know there's better researchers out there than just me. Um, but I've looked at newspapers because, you know, we used to have like the crime blotter. For those of you old enough to remember the newspaper, we had like the crime blotter. Do you think they would have said, oh, there was a search of a farm out in Concord County this week? But no, couldn't find anything like that. Um, I even asked, um, honestly, my DA, who we all love, Cheryl Temple, big heart, I asked her, how could I, what do I do? How do I find this out? And she's like, God, Jen, you're kind of screwed. This one is hard to say. So let's go back to the source. So let's, okay, all that. You know, I put in the effort. I have tried hard to, to prove the affirmative here, which is who got the search warrant. Couldn't do that. Um, I think it might be because it came out of the DEA as well. I don't know, he says state and federal narcotics officers, so a good chance it could have been an interagency thing. Um, meth was apparently like out of control in Concord in that time, as opposed to now when it's still out of control. Uh, it, Concord has some very rural areas. It's, it's pretty close to San Francisco, but there are some definitely more Delta on the Delta, which is the waterways kind of areas. Uh, okay, so, but let's go back to Larry, because Michelle, of course, called Larry about this more than once. Um, and he said, it's true. And she said, it's not true. Please prove it. And he won't. He will not prove it. And therein, that's the problem right there. Because if you make an assertion like this, and this is defamatory, and even if it was or was not true, his conclusions are full of crap. This whole thing is full of crap. But to take out a victim like this, who has to hold her head up, but to say, ah, oh, she deserved it because, you know, maybe rape wasn't her ultimate fantasy. That's a sentence in this book, you guys. This is a sentence. Maybe the rape wasn't her ultimate fantasy. Maybe this was. Do you understand how despicable that is and how this has changed her life? Okay, so my goal here is, and I, and I, and I care about having um, an end game for this stuff. I don't need to just talk to talk to you guys. I mean, I, I would love to because I love to talk and I love you guys. But my end game here is really that he doesn't get to hold his head high and walk into sentencing on Friday. And I don't know if he'll be there. I don't know if I'd recognize him. He's going to look as old as D'Angelo, frankly. Um, but he's not a hero here. I'm sorry, but he's not. A lot of people will hold him in high regard, but I really can't even find the heroism. I've read other parts of this damn tome 
this big heap of wasted words, and I can't find the hero part because he's sexist and he's judgmental and he's discriminatory and he's biased and he sees rape in terms of sexuality and not in terms of the power, control, and violence that it is. Just if you throw all that out alone, if, you, if you're a police officer and that's your bias, those are your beliefs, you're on the wrong beat, baby. You better move over to burglary because you don't belong in sex crimes. Sex crimes, and, and I do appreciate um, all the law and order SVU going back and watching. There's a, there's a whole thing in like season three where, um, what's his name? The guy, the guy, uh, Elliot goes on this, this kind of little tirade, this little soapbox about who does and doesn't belong in sex crimes. It's because somebody else gets kicked out. I forget who got kicked out. But the point was, oh, it was uh, it was Cassidy. Um, he gets kicked out because he can't take it. Because it makes him, for in this case, it makes him too mad. But Elliot, Elliot's whole point is that if you come to sex crimes, you don't bring the bias. You don't bring the judgment. You don't bring the prejudice. You, it's not sexual. You have to know all that stuff. You have to move beyond this the, 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 the conversation that happens all the time about, oh, boys will be boys. No, it's locker room talk. Nope, it's not. Nope, 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 nope. You want to talk like that drunk somewhere, you better make sure your phone isn't on, nobody's recording it. And then you also just need to check in on your bias. And that's why we recorded this because my bias was I was pissed and I had profanity spewing out of my mouth. But I think this calmer approach is much better. I'm extremely interested in your feedback on this topic. Um, please uh, let me know, write, whatever, uh, have a conversation. We're going to talk about this in a few minutes, I hope, on the Zoom call. But I, I wanted to bring this sober, sober perspective to light and reveal what's gone on here behind the scenes. There is a lot of hurt behind the scenes, some blame, some politics. But this one, this one tore me up. I've been torn up about this for about two weeks, but Michelle really wanted to get that statement out today on her own. And I, I so honor her for that. And, and her biggest thing was that he doesn't get to hold his head high as a victor in this because really he needs to hold his head low in shame. All right. That's the lawyer's daughter for right now. I will talk to you soon. End of day two. I'm going to get some sleep tonight. I go up tomorrow. And uh, I thank you for listening.